Our next investigation begins now in Trenton. First settled over 300 years ago, Trenton has played a prominent role in our region for century after century after American century. So it's not surprising to me that this history marker, which sits on top of a highway tunnel, actually spans several acres. Now, there are arches throughout here, front and back. They're all constructed of different materials representing different eras in the city's history. And there are plaques strewn throughout the grounds here that relate to a slew of details about Trenton's illustrious past. Some about the American Revolution, some about the Industrial Revolution, but one thing seems incredibly loud and clear. This is one big history. I'm off to talk to Anthony. With such history spanning so many eras, there have to be all sorts of stories to uncover. I'm off to the Guggenheim Library, housed in the former summer estate of Murray and Leone Guggenheim on the campus of Monmouth University, where drive-by historian Anthony Bernard is standing by, ready to help me bridge this tremendous timeline. So Anthony, I've just come from a history marker that is arguably one of the largest I've ever seen. It's these four enormous arches and there are plaques that are strewn throughout the ground detailing different eras in Trenton's development. What can you tell me about it? Well, there's no doubt about it. There's a lot of history in Trenton. But what I want to start with is a sign that most of us have probably already seen. It's mounted on the side of Truss Bridge and it says, Trenton makes, the world takes. Trenton was a manufacturing hub in the 20th century. Wow, so what was made there? Pottery. Everything from toilets to teacups. Trenton was arguably the pottery capital of the nation. Have you ever heard of Lennox, China? I have. That was made in Trenton. I remember Nancy Reagan back in the 1980s purchasing Lennox, China for the White House. Exactly, China of presidents. What else was made there? Everything from felt tip pens to oyster crackers to aspirin, anything to do with rubber or steel. In fact, the wires used to make the Brooklyn Bridge were actually manufactured in Trenton. So Trenton was a real manufacturing center. And Trenton has a sports history as well. On November 7th, 1896, the world's first professional basketball game was played in Trenton. Who'd they play? Brooklyn. Who won? Trenton. <laughs> Not only that, but in the mid-19th century, one of the first state-of-the-art psychiatric hospitals was built in Trenton. And in the War of 1812, going back a little further, it, Trenton was the site of the primary army hospital. And the Battle of Trenton? Huge history. A turning point in the Revolutionary War. Washington really needed that victory. And that takes us back to the colonial period, which is exactly where I want to go. There's information surfacing right now that's shedding new light on colonial Trenton 50 years before the start of the Revolutionary War. And it's just surfacing now? Right now. And that's where this next investigation begins. To find out more, Anthony sends me back to Trenton, to one of the oldest historic sites in not only Trenton, but the entire region. As I arrive, I'm greeted by Professor Rich Veit, a familiar face on drive by history. He's the Associate Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Monmouth University. And after a number of investigations together, he's also become a friend. We are in downtown Trenton, New Jersey at the William Trent House. Ah, okay. And Trent House, I'm assuming in Trenton, there's got to be a connection. There is indeed. So yeah. the city of Trenton is named after William Trent, okay. the successful merchant who settled here and built his country estate. The Trent House to 1719, given it's among the oldest in the area, Rich believes secrets about the region's colonial past are hidden here. And since Rich is also an archaeologist, he's eager to bring those secrets to light. Along with his students, he's begun an excavation. And we're digging here specifically because we did a radar survey and it showed that there's some things below ground and we've started to uncover them. Trenton, or Trent Town as it was first known, is of particular interest to Rich. Located on the Delaware, the community sits at the farthest point upriver that an ocean-going ship could navigate. As a result, we discover another way in which Trenton sits at the nexus of our region's history. It was among the earliest centers of commerce, and it thrived as it facilitated trade between Europe and the colonies. Shortly after my tour of the site, Rich assembled his crew. Within minutes, the trenches were bustling with activity. 
Tell me about the process here. What's going on? What are we looking at? We've got a couple things going on. Over to your right, we've got the actual excavation. And we have a series of five foot squares and a big trench. Using state of the art technology, Rich has zeroed in on the exact spot he wants to excavate. Radar is an earlier structure here, or at least something underground, and we're trying to find out. So you knew this was your target area? This was our target area. Rich thinks that earlier structure is a house which dates to the 1600s, thought to be a more modest home located on the same site. In other words, the discoveries made here could date back to the very first settlers living in the area. I can't wait to see the kinds of items that have been concealed by the soil for so long. So I see them filling up this bucket, right? And then what happens? So they're gonna excavate carefully with trowels all that soil. They put it in a bucket, and then it's gonna go to one of the screens. Okay. And it gets in the screen, we shake it, the soil falls away, the artifacts are revealed, and we save them. They're also gonna be taking notes about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, from those notes and those artifacts, we put together a picture of what was happening here. After a quick lesson on proper screening technique, Rich invited me to assist in the excavation, and together we sifted through the dirt, hoping to find pieces from the past. All right, then we shake. We shake it up, back and forth. Okay. I see stuff starting to come to the surface that doesn't look like dirt or rock. Yes. So you look at the color and the texture, and we're going to look for anything yep. that's not okay. natural. Yeah, we've got all sorts of things here. Oh, you found a nail. There's a nail. Okay, so look at this. Is this a nail that would have been made here? I think so. So it's got a hand wrought head on it. Wow. And it's a little bit wicky, as though somebody had some trouble either hammering it in or pulling it out. Because the colonies were growing rapidly, demand for nails often pace supply. Ruined buildings were sometimes burned, so colonials could scavenge nails from the ashes and reuse them. Is it possible that's what we're seeing here? A reason behind the scarcity of nails involves the way in which they were made, one at a time by a blacksmith. Highly skilled and also well-educated in the science of weights and measures, blacksmiths were held in esteem and earned a respectable living. It wasn't uncommon for families to buy apprenticeships for their sons, to give them an opportunity in a lucrative field. I can't help but wonder if Trenton's manufacturing legacy, which Anthony and I spoke about in the library, in some ways can be traced back to this nail. But that's not the only find. I thought I had seen, oh I did, here. Ah. So we also have uh, an Is oyster, a, shell? a big oyster. So today, right, we import a lot of our oysters, but a very common food in colonial America. Oysters reflect an interesting shift in the American palate. Early colonists in Trenton and elsewhere viewed oysters as something that should only be consumed out of necessity. However, by the time of the American Revolution, oysters were served on the most elegant tables. The affluent might have eaten oysters that were stewed or pickled, but that's not to say this oyster was eaten by a member of the affluent Trent family. Oysters were abundant in the region, and the poor would have eaten them too, though they would have been prepared differently, perhaps rolled in cornmeal and fried. In other words, it's possible this oyster was eaten by William Trent himself, or by a dinner guest, or a worker, or even one of William Trent's slaves. So there were enslaved people on this property? There were. Slavery was unfortunately common in New Jersey and New York and up into New England. We can expect 10 to 15 percent of the population in the colonial time period was enslaved. At a second site, Rich and his team are excavating an area likely used by the slaves, as well as indentured servants and hired help. So here we're excavating the remains of a kitchen a two-story structure with living quarters for workers, this kitchen was built adjacent to the main house. In some colonial homes, the kitchen was located in the basement with the heat coveted in the cold winter months. The Trent family, however, chose to separate them, and they did it for a very compelling reason. So in the 18th century, fire is a big problem, right? If you're cooking in the house and that fire gets out of control, you could lose your whole house. Colonials feared the dreaded cry of fire. Many residents volunteered for nightly patrols that searched for glowing embers or smoldering brushwood. 
And when a blaze did ignite, colonial first responders arrived not only with buckets of water, but also with bed keys to quickly disassemble the valuable wooden frame of a bed, as well as salvage bags to snatch up other belongings. While the students continue the excavation tirelessly, Rich pulls me aside to a nearby bench to show me another fascinating discovery made on this property. So this is one of my favorites. Yeah? A yellow rock. I know, it doesn't look like much of anything. You aim high. <laughs> <laughs> so true. But in fact, it's a Dutch brick made in the Netherlands. Uh, was there a certain time period when these bricks were popular? Yeah, these were popular in the 1600s into the early 1700s. Brick making was among the earliest trades in the colonies, with bricks needed for ovens, roads, and foundations. However, the piece of brick Rich discovered comes from Holland, from a time when bricks had to be imported to the colonies because there simply weren't enough people here to harvest and mold the clay needed to make them. Hard as it is to believe, there was a time when something as basic as a brick had to be imported, an expensive and weighty proposition. The find suggests to Rich that this site might be more than an early homestead. It might be among the very first places Europeans ever lived in the region. Wow, so we're in ground zero for the Europeans coming over? We really are. Okay. As the day draws to a close, I find myself awed by the discoveries made here. It's true, we did not uncover works of art or lost maps, but these items are historical treasures all the same. In fact, they're extremely valuable pieces because they speak to colonial life broadly, informing us about the multitude of people who weren't famous enough to have papers or books written about them at the time. So it's a really powerful way to learn about the past that complements what the written documents already tell us. Sometimes small pieces tell a really big story, and to me, it seems fitting we discovered them here in Trenton. A place brimming history, overflowing with it even, and the home of an enormous history marker, quite possibly the largest I've ever seen. See you next time.